definitely a pleasure to be here and uh, participating in this symposium um, on this topic, a uh, very important topic of uh, opioid addiction. When uh, Dr. Um, Truck Nguyen approached me about um, speaking uh, at this um, event, uh, we thought that it would be a good uh, idea to kind of kick things off with a little bit of information about the scope of the problem, so I have a few statistics for you. Uh, but my main uh, focus will be to talk about the mechanisms of action of opioids, how they can relieve pain, how they can, and how they can become um, abused substances. I think it'll be good for us to kind of uh, understand uh, how these drugs work as kind of a start uh, to this event. So uh, here are some statistics from the uh, Centers for Disease Control uh, where we're looking at uh, overdose deaths involving opioids in the United States uh, from 2000 uh, to 2015. And uh, what we have here is the data expressed as uh, deaths per 100,000 uh, people. And you can see that uh, from uh, the year 2000, uh, there's been um, a steady uh, increase in uh, deaths caused by commonly prescribed opioids. But then very recently, around uh, 2010, 2011, there's been a huge increase in deaths caused by any opioid, driven mainly by an increase in deaths caused by heroin and other synthetic opioids uh, such as fentanyl. Both of these drugs, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, how they work. So the summary here is that we have a growing trend where opioid deaths have been uh, increasing steadily uh, for quite a few years. These are more data from the CDC looking at heroin specifically since heroin has played such an important role in the current uh, increasing trend in deaths uh, by opioid overdose. And what we have here in the light blue are uh, deaths per 100,000 in the year 2014. And then in the, the darker blue, almost black color, are uh, deaths due to heroin uh, in 2015. And you can see uh, there is an increase in all regions of the United States. And this uh, increase between 2014 and 2015 uh, is statistically significant for all regions, uh, with the Northeast and the Midwest uh, leading the way in this uh, increase in heroin uh, deaths between 2014 and 2015. Similarly, I mentioned that uh, current trends in the uh, increase in opioid deaths is, uh, in addition to heroin is being driven strongly by increases in deaths uh, due to synthetic opioids uh, such as fentanyl. And uh, these are similar data comparing t uh, deaths per 100,000 in 2014 and 2015. And uh, this is where we really see some large increases. Uh, the lighter color is 2014, the darker color uh, is uh, 2015. And in some of these regions, such as uh, the Northeast and the Midwest, we have almost a two-fold increase in deaths due to synthetic opioids um, 2015 compared to uh, 2014. So we have some very troubling trends um, and um, it's worth talking a little bit and I think this will be talked about more as we move through the day uh, why these trends exist. Um, if we think back uh, to the uh, 80s and 90s, there was um, a growing um, uh, idea in, um, in uh, the world of, the, of, the, of clinical care that pain was being undertreated and that people were suffering too much with pain because practitioners were hesitant uh, to uh, prescribe opioids. And so this led to the idea that pain should be considered the fifth vital sign and should therefore be uh, treated um, aggressively. On top of that, this was also the beginning of the idea of uh, hospitals um, improving their quality of care by uh, a number of measures, but one of those is by uh, providing surveys to the patients, and those surveys often have questions, how was your pain controlled? Did the physician do enough to control your pain? So the, an incentive program was set up uh, that really ended up uh, encouraging uh, the treatment of pain, but along with that, encouraging the uh, pr uh, prescription of opioids. Uh, 
And then uh, this, another uh, thing that was happening along with these uh, two trends was the role of the pharmaceutical in industry. Uh, very aggressive physician marketing materials have been used uh, for the last couple of decades by the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, they've argued that slow release um, uh, formulations of opioids are less addicting, which may not be true. And um, they've argued that there's a low uh, risk for addiction with long-term use, which is not uh, entirely true. So um, now, in the, as we move from the 90s into the 21st century, slowly but surely the pendulum has swung the other way, where we're no longer under-treating pain, but perhaps over-treating it at least with opioids, and that may be a, um, an important factor that has uh, led to the uh, current crisis. These are some more data for you just to underscore uh, the role of heroin and synthetic opioids in current trends. Uh, here on the left, we have um, heroin seizures by law enforcement. So we're not talking about clinical seizures. These are, this is grabbing the, the law enforcement grabbing the drug, seizing the drug. So heroin seizures in the United States uh, from 2010 uh, to 2015. And there's been just a steady increase um, indicating that heroin is more and more um, present uh, in, in society. And then here on the, on the right are some re really dramatic data. This is the number of law enforcement encounters with fentanyl in the U.S. Uh, 2010 to 2015. And you can see uh, starting in 2013 just a huge spike in uh, the number of times that law enforcement uh, encounter or seize um, the synthetic opioid of fentanyl. Now the reason for this is because what the drug cartels are doing is they, right around 2013, they began to spike their heroin with fentanyl uh, because fentanyl is so potent and it gives more bang for the buck, so to speak. It gives a stronger high at a, at a lower dose. And uh, this is why um, fentanyl um, is, uh, is on the rise uh, in terms of law enforcement encounters. As we'll talk about, the problem with that, yes, fentanyl is much more potent uh, than other opioids for giving a high, but it's also more po potent uh, as an agent that can uh, cause respiratory depression, uh, leading to uh, overdose death. So it's very troubling, uh, this rise of, of fentanyl being um, out there uh, in the um, illicit drug supply. On top of that, the problem may be getting even worse more recently with the agent carfentanil, which is not used uh, in the, for uh, the treatment of um, human patients, but it is used to sedate large animals for veterinary applications. And by large animals, I mean like elephants and rhinos. And carfentanil is much more potent than fentanyl. And we'll talk about the numbers here in a minute. And there have been some uh, cases recently in Ohio of uh, fatal carfentanil overdoses. So this is heroin that is laced or spiked with carfentanil that naloxone was not able to reverse. And we'll talk a little bit later about how naloxone is able to um, uh, re uh, reverse opioid um, overdose. So a very concerning situation. All right, so those are some data just to try to give a general idea of the scope uh, of the problem uh, that we're facing. Uh, what I have here um, is a, so the purpose of this slide is to remind us uh, what the opioids are. Uh, the term opioid is used for uh, any substance, whether it's uh, natural occurring, uh, such as the morphine that's found in this sticky resin uh, from the poppy plant, or a synthetic agent. All of these agents are called opioids because they all work by binding to and activating the so-called mu opioid receptor. So the mu opioid receptor is a receptor expressed by uh, many neurons uh, in the nervous system um, that uh, these opioid uh, compounds bind to and activate, uh, triggering a, a biochemical uh, signaling cascade, which we'll talk about a little bit. I won't hit you over the head with too much biochemistry just enough so that you can feel smart. So uh, what I've sh shown here is I've listed some common opioids and their uh, potency. And we use a oral dose of 10 milligrams of morphine as kind of our standard. And so the potency of such a dose is one. And what I'm showing here is the relative potency of some other agents. Um, you can notice that we can increase the potency, that is the dose required to give a defined effect, by a, a defined effect, uh, by uh, changing the uh, route of administration. So if we go to an IV dose of morphine, we can increase the potency um, threefold. Uh, 
Um, some other things to point out here, heroin IV, four to five uh, fold more potent than a 10 milligram oral dose of morphine. So, and we'll talk a little bit later about why heroin is, is more uh, potent than morphine. And then here is fentanyl. It's 50 to 100 times more potent than a 10 milligram dose of morphine. So a very potent um, agent. And then not on the table, carfentanyl is 10,000 times, think about that, 10,000 times more potent than a 10 milligram dose of, um, of uh, orally administered morphine. So a uh, very dangerous drug, so potent, as, as I mentioned, that uh, it's very difficult to reverse, if, if not impossible to reverse, uh, with naloxone. So, big point here, all of these agents are called opioids because they all act by the same mechanism of action. They all act as agonists at the mu opioid receptor. They all stimulate the mu opioid receptor. So, the most um, famous and common use for the opioids is uh, to uh, produce analgesia, to reduce the perception of pain. So to understand that mechanism, to understand how opioids are analgesic agents, how they're able to reduce pain, we need to talk a little bit about the anatomy of pain transmission, which I've illustrated here on this slide. So uh, we have, um, the first step is we have what is referred to as an afferent nociceptor. These are neurons that have the job of uh, receiving painful stimulus, so here, part A, this is meant to represent the skin. So uh, afferent nociceptors uh, receive pain stimuli and then transmit that signal to the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And then the neurons of the dorsal horn of the spinal cord cross the midline, relay the pain information uh, to the uh, medulla and brainstem. And then from there, the message is relayed to the thalamus and on to parts of the cortex, somatosensory cortex that is responsible for uh, our perception of pain. Now, throughout this pathway, the, uh, the neurons that are involved in this pathway, um, they all express the mu opioid receptor. So recall, this is the molecule, this is the receptor to which uh, opioids bind um, to exert their effect. So let's talk a little bit more about what opioids do and how their binding to the mu opioid receptor results in a reduction in pain transmission. So what we have here is a kind of a, a, a magnified view of this synapse or connection here. So we're gonna focus on the mu opioid receptors uh, that are present uh, in the synapse between the afferent nociceptors which we'll refer to as our presynaptic neurons, and our dorsal horn neurons, which we will refer to as our postsynaptic neurons. So in order to understand how the opioids are able to uh, reduce pain, we need to understand a little bit about uh, neural transmission. So a neural transmission, uh, the transmission of information between neurons is a uh, cooperation between um, an electrical mechanism and a chemical mechanism, an electrical signal and a chemical uh, signal. So what happens when this here is the, uh, the primary afferent nociceptor. So when this neuron receives some painful stimulus, it will become electrically active. It will fire action potentials. And when the action potential reaches the uh, presynaptic terminal here, that will cause these calcium channels to open and calcium will flow into the presynaptic terminal. And calcium, uh, through a detailed process that we'll uh, not worry about today, uh, will mediate the uh, release of neurotransmitter from this presynaptic terminal. And the neurotransmitter used here in the pain pathways um, is the amino acid uh, glutamate. The important thing to know is that this release of glutamate into the synapse is calcium dependent. You have to have these channels opening in response to the action potential, and you have to have calcium entering the neuron uh, to mediate the uh, uh, vesicular release, the release of glutamate from these vesicular, um, from these synaptic vesicles. Now once glutamate is released, this is the chemical signal for pain that will be relayed to the next neuron. So this is the postsynaptic terminal, this is the postsynaptic terminal of those um, neurons found in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Uh, 
Glutamate will bind its receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, and these receptors are ion channels that are opened when glutamate binds, and these ion channels allow sodium to flow in, providing an electrical signal for this neuron that, that can then be relayed up to the brainstem and, and just kind of like links in a chain all the way up uh, to the somatosensory cortex. Now, I like to refer to opioids mechanism of analgesia, analgesia as being kind of a double whammy inhibition because as I'll describe in a moment here, when um, an opioid binds to the mu opioid receptors, which are expressed both presynaptically and postsynaptically, we have a way um, in which the uh, opioid is able to block both the release of the chemical signal, glutamate, and the electrical activity in the postsynaptic neuron that would normally be uh, stimulated by glutamate. So, what happens here, we have a mu opioid receptor. We have mu opioid receptors expressed on the presynaptic terminal. And when an opioid agonist binds to these receptors, there's a cascade of biochemical ev events that inhibits those calcium channels and prevents them from opening. If you don't have calcium going in, you won't get glutamate release. So you're stopping the pain signal there by preventing the release of glutamate. So that is the presynaptic way, one of the whammies by which opioids uh, inhibit pain. They inhibit transmitter release um, at the, the synapse in the uh, dorsal horn of the spinal cord. Interestingly though, there, is also, there are also mu opioid receptors expressed on the postsynaptic neuron. And here when the opioid binds to and stimulates these receptors, we have a, a complex cascade of biochemical events that causes potassium channels to open. Potassium is more concentrated on the inside of the neuron than the outside. Potassium will flow out. So this is positive charge leaving the neuron, which is counteracting any entry of the positive sodium uh, entering the neuron. This prevents the electrical activity in the neuron that would normally be provided by glutamate. So the second whammy here is that the mu opioids inhibit action potentials in the postsynaptic neurons uh, found here uh, in the dorsal cord, dor uh, dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So double whammy inhibition, both pre and postsynaptic mechanisms. And this is kind of on the uh, biochemical level, maybe even we could say on the molecular level, that uh, this is the reason that mu opioids are such potent inhibitors of pain because they don't, they act in more than one location. They don't just act pre or postsynaptically, they act in both locations. And then on top of that, there are opioid receptors expressed in the other synapses on up the pathway, uh, all the way up to the somatosensory cortex. So this is all great news if your goal is to inhibit pain. And in fact, um, if you go back to the uh, 19th century, specifically the 1860s in the United States, it was during the Civil War that opium and morphine was really uh, first used in a widespread way to deal with pain. So soldiers that were injured in the war, it became very common to inject with morphine. The hyper, uh, hypodermic syringe was also invented uh, around that time. And so this is fantastic, a very potent, very uh, effective way to reduce pain. But we have a problem. And this is a very common problem in pharmacology in which our therapeutic target is not only located where, uh, at the, in the tissue that we're targeting. In other words, the mu opioid receptor is not just expressed in the pain pathway, but expressed in other neural sy uh, systems. And the action of opioids at uh, the mu opioid receptors in these other systems is responsible for some very serious side effects or adverse events that are associated with um, uh, pain therapy uh, using opioids. So what I've shown here is a unnecessarily complicated slide of the brainstem and the pons, just showing different nuclei in the reticular formation of the brainstem that are involved in controlling respiration. And all of these nuclei, maybe not all, but at least many of them, express the mu opioid receptor. Now, when an opioid is binding to the mu opioid receptor and inhibiting neuronal activity and neurons that are involved in pain, that's wonderful. That will reduce pain transmission and that will reduce pain. 
But here, when we reduce the activity of these neurons and we slow breathing, when we produce respiratory depression, that's bad news. And that's a side effect that we want to avoid. And in fact, the cause of death in opioid overdose is the cessation of breathing. It's respiratory depression to the point that breathing stops. And that is all due to the fact that these nuclei in the brainstem that control breathing express the mu-opioid receptors. When opioids bind the receptors there and inhibit the activity in those neurons, breathing slows, and if the dose is high enough, breathing can stop. So opioids depress respiration. Another place in the brain um, that complicates the use of opioids to treat pain um, is the reward circuit. This is another location in the brain where the mu opioid receptor uh, is expressed. And this is a simplified version of the reward circuit here. Um, this is showing you kind of on a grand scale. This is a sagittal section of a rat brain uh, showing you uh, how the connections work. Uh, but here is kind of a uh, amplified view of, at the neuronal level. The reward circuit is a circuit in our brain, a, a way to describe it in the simple terms is that um, it motivates a survival type behaviors because activity in this circus, a circuit is closely associated with stimuli that, are, uh, that have the subjective feature of being pleasurable. So, and many of these pleasurable activities are uh, survival type behaviors that the organism needs to engage in either for the survival of the individual or the survival of the species. So these are things like eating, drinking, having sex. All of these activities are closely associated with uh, subjective feelings of pleasure and on the neuronal level, on the neurochemical level, with the release of dopamine by these bluish neurons here. Now, what opioids do, and this is true really of every drug of abuse, is they enhance dopamine release in this reward circuit. A couple of words about how that works mechanistically. So here are our dopamine neurons that fire and release dopamine in close association with um, survival type behaviors uh, that are pleasurable. This neuron here is an inhibitory neuron that normally will inhibit the activity of these dopamine neurons. But this inhib these inhibitory neurons express the mu opioid receptor. So when an opioid binds to its receptors expressed here, what we have is inhibition of the inhibitor, which results in excitation. So yes, double negatives are allowed in neuropharmacology. Okay? So you, when the inhibitor is, inhibitor is inhibited by an opioid, you'll have an increase in activity of dopamine here. So this is how opioids activate the reward circuit. It's by inhibiting the inhibitor of the reward circuit. Additionally, there are mu opioid receptors expressed here. And interestingly enough, this dopamine signal that is associated with pleasure is an inhibitory signal on these, this neuron. Well, this neuron expresses mu opioid receptors. When opioids bind here, what happens? This neuron is inhibited. So at these locations, the opioid is mimicking dopamine. So opioids uh, enhance dopamine release in the circuit and also mimic what dopamine does uh, in the circuit. So I've mentioned that dopamine release is associated with subjective experience of pleasure. So what opioids do, uh, opioids uh, hijack the reward circuit. And um, the consequence of this in terms of the behavior of the individual is that opioid abuse is motivated, at least in part, by a survival-like need to experience the pleasure of the high. Because remember, we're tapping into a circuit in the brain who ha that has the normal purpose of motivating the organism to engage in survival-like behaviors. So when a drug of abuse like an opioid hijacks this circuit, what the drug is doing is it's making the brain function as if use of the drug is necessary for survival. And so what you have in, in the individual is an uncontrolled compulsion to use the opioid. 
Now note that I'm saying partly here. That's because this uh, compulsive um, need to in use the, the opioid for the subjective high is not the whole story and doesn't fully explain the behavior of the individual who is abusing an opioid. So we also have uh, the situation that can kind of be summed up as tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal. And this is, a, I think, a simple a scheme here to explain how this contributes to, uh, uh, this process contributes to opioid um, abuse. So you'll recall from your physiology that physiological systems are very conservative, right? They don't like change. And we refer to that conservative nature in physiological systems as um, the maintenance of homeostasis. So this theory, this idea of homeostasis can help us understand a little bit about opioid abuse. So imagine a physiological system, including the nervous system. It's just moving along happily here in homeostasis. And then a drug is used, an opioid is used, and that is a disturbance in homeostasis. Now physiological systems, such as the brain and nervous system, they will um, activate a whole suite of counter-regulatory mechanisms compensatory mechanisms that work in the opposite direction of the drug in an attempt to maintain homeostasis to counteract the physiological effects of that drug. And so this is, this is tolerance. So the drug will become less effective over time. The opioid will become less effective over time because of compensatory mechanisms in the neurons that are counteracting the drug, such as changing uh, receptor uh, density on the surface of the neuron. And there are some others as well. So now we reachieve homeostasis in the presence of the drug because of these compensatory mechanisms. But then imagine that the individual attempts to abstain. They recognize using this drug is not a constructive force uh, in my life. I'm going to stop using it. Well, what happens is the compensatory mechanisms in the brain and nervous system don't go away just because the individual stopped using the drug. So instead of having analgesia, we have pain. Instead of being calmed and sedated by the opioid, now we have anxiety and restlessness. Instead of having constipation, now we have diarrhea. Instead of having bodily secretions being dried out, now we have tearing and a, a runny nose. And it turns out in the case of opioids, the uh, disturbance in homeostasis that's in the opposite direction of the drug feels very, very, very bad. It's not fatal. But the pay, like, some, like withdrawal from some other substances, but the individual feels like they're going to die. It feels like the worst case of the flu that they've ever had. Now think about this. This becomes a powerful motivator to do what? To use the drug and reachieve homeostasis. So the individual who's abusing an opioid, not only do they have this survival-like compulsive drive to get high, they also can't feel well and can't function in life without the drug. So we have kind of a two-pronged reason here for the drug abuse that I would submit, as respectfully as I can, has nothing to do with moral failings in the individual. It has to do with what's happening uh, to their brain and body physiologically. Okay, so those are some uh, mechanisms of how the opioids work. And what I want to do now is highlight just a few specific opioids and uh, talk about their characteristics and, and what makes them um, some of these uh, unique. Hmm. Sure. It would eventually, but most people can't just go, 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 turkey, go cold turkey and wait. So it would take a few weeks, but a few weeks of very extreme suffering is not something that most individuals can do. Well, that's a little bit out, outside of my field. I think that um, it, it varies for practitioners. Um, so we'll talk about methadone briefly in a moment, methadone maintenance therapy. Some, there are individuals and there are practitioners that think methadone maintenance needs to occur forever for the rest of the individual's life. Others will, uh, after a few weeks or months, uh, taper off the methadone um, as long as the person doesn't have withdrawal symptoms when that's happening. 
So I want to talk a little bit about heroin. We've mentioned it uh, already as being an important contributor to our current uh, opioid crisis. Um, and one thing to keep in mind here, all of these agents, I've said this a few times, they all have the same mechanism of action. So none of them are really unique mechanistically, but they do have some uh, different characteristics. Um, heroin's got a really bad uh, reputation. It's Schedule I um, in the United States. There are no medical uh, uses uh, for it. Um, but it's more similar uh, to the other opioids than differences uh, despite this bad uh, reputation. So here is our granddaddy opioid, morphine. And you can see that heroin in terms of chemical structure is the only difference is the addition of these acetyl groups at these two locations. And it turns out that heroin itself, when it has this, these acetyl groups, doesn't bind opioid receptors. It's inactive. Its activity requires conversion to morphine in the brain. So heroin is just a morphine prodrug. It ends up being four to five times more potent than morphine because it is more lipophilic than morphine. So you can think of the brain as a lump of fat. And heroin, by the IV route, moves into the brain very quickly and very efficiently, and that explains its uh, higher potency can give a larger effect at a given dose, about four to five uh, fold more than morphine, because its higher lipophilicity really promotes its brain entry. And then once it's in, in the brain, enzymes in the brain remove these acetyl groups and convert heroin to morphine. So heroin is just uh, a very potent uh, morphine prodrug. Now, I mentioned naloxone earlier. Um, naloxone is a very fast, effective treatment for opioid overdose, and it's quite dramatic. Um, some of you may have had the opportunity to see this. Someone can be breathing very slowly, unconscious, given an in injection of naloxone, and almost instantly they're sitting up in the bed demanding to be released from the hospital because they suddenly feel better. The way naloxone works is that it's what we refer to in pharmacology as an antagonist. So it binds to the mu opioid receptor, and it binds the same spot on the receptor that the opioids do. So it competes for uh, the binding site on the receptor uh, with the opioids, and if the dose is high enough, it will outcompete the opioid. So when the naloxone binds to the receptor, it's blocking the uh, heroin or morphine or oxycodone or whatever has been overdosed on, preventing that agent from binding the receptor and exerting its effect. So we refer to this as competitive uh, antagonism. Because when the naloxone binds, it, it doesn't activate the receptor. It does not kick off the biochemical cascade that alters uh, neuronal activity the way the agonists do. So naloxone reverses the sedation and the respiratory depression and can save someone from a fatal overdose. But a very important clinical point that is always stressed is that its duration of action is only 30 to 60 minutes. The liver clears naloxone more quickly than, uh, and metabolizes naloxone more quickly than many of the opioids. So the, it, we will often require more than one dose, and even after the patient is feeling better and demanding to leave the hospital, they need to be observed for a while because there have been a, a number of cases reported uh, in the literature and then just anecdotally of someone being released from the hospital too soon after the naloxone treatment. They feel great, they go home, the naloxone is metabolized, cleared from the body, and there's still enough oxycodone, oxycodone or heroin there to cause overdose, and the person goes back into sedation and respiratory depression and possibly coma and death, even though they had received this naloxone therapy. So it often takes more than one treatment, and the person should definitely be observed um, and kept at the hospital for a little while uh, after uh, recovery. The great thing about naloxone, no effect in a non-user harmless and, and safe, and um, many states are beginning to recognize this and make it more available, um, but I think we have a long way to go. I think it should be very available. I think this should be, um, in my opinion, something that you can easily get uh, and use uh, to help someone who is uh, overdosed on an opioid. I mentioned briefly already uh, methadone maintenance therapy for uh, the treatment of opioid addiction. So not only can opioid overdose be uh, treated with naloxone, uh, opioid abuse disorder can be treated uh, pharmacologically. And uh, a drug that, is, that can be used to treat opioid uh, use disorder is uh, methadone. And it's because of methadone's um, lack of efficacy, 
or I should say lack of potency, lack of potency and because of its pharmacokinetic characteristics that make this work. So this, I think these graphs, if we get into them a little bit, uh, help illustrate this point. So here we have intensity of drug effect and intensity of withdrawal in response to IV heroin. So you see heroin, gives, when it's taken IV, gives a very quick high that then dissipates in just a few hours. So someone who has a um, heroin uh, use disorder every day they're experiencing withdrawal. And this is why it's, it's so, uh, uh, such a problem in, in terms of being able to function in life, is they're pretty much in a constant state of withdrawal and constantly needing to find heroin and use heroin in order to uh, not feel sick. But an oral dose of methadone has a much slower developing uh, effect. Now look at withdrawal, here are the, here are the, here's how heroin withdrawal uh, uh, works. And you can see withdrawal if nothing is done and, and, this, and these data disappears um, in not quite two weeks, a little more than a week. But here is methadone um, withdrawal, much slower developing. So what happens is if, if someone who has a heroin use disorder can be given methadone, methadone will not give the, the uh, very salient high that heroin does. So that's um, preventing the uh, high and uh, taking away that positive reinforcement for using the drug. And then furthermore, if the patient does try to use heroin while on methadone, methadone will compete with, uh, with heroin for uh, receptor binding sites. To be more precise, will compete with heroin converted to morphine uh, for receptor binding sites and prevent the high. So we don't get the high with the methadone, but importantly, when the methadone is there, we stave off withdrawal. So we can provide a drug that doesn't uh, produce as strong of a high and prevent withdrawal so that the patient can function in life, go to work, go to school without feeling um, so uh, sick and ill. So this is why it's referred to as methadone maintenance programs. We're maintaining uh, the individual's functioning by giving them um, a less uh, potent opioid uh, and preventing the withdrawal with that less potent opi uh, opioid. A similar rationale is with uh, buprenorphine. Uh, so the combination product, uh, so, which is buprenorphine with naloxone, is referred to uh, uh, by the trade name uh, Suboxone. Buprenorphine works similarly to methadone, but the pharmacological details are a little bit different. So buprenorphine is a partial agonist of the mu opioid receptor, meaning it binds the receptor and stimulates it, but doesn't give as large of an effect as a full agonist like, uh, like morphine would. So we have the same idea here where we're giving opioid that gives less of an effect doesn't uh, make the individual high as long as the dose is right, but it also staves off withdrawal, prevents the individual uh, from experiencing uh, the terrible uh, withdrawal symptoms. Now the naloxone uh, is included just to uh, discourage uh, diversion. So if someone tried to take suboxone and grind it up and then inject it to get high, it wouldn't work because the naloxone is there to uh, block opioid receptors. So uh, this is a summary slide here. We have uh, a growing problem with opioid um, abuse and uh, opioid overdose uh, in the United States. It's been going on for a few years now. Um, opioids are effective analgesics uh, due to this kind of uh, double whammy mechanism uh, that I described. But the problem is mu opioid receptors are expressed in other parts of the nervous system, namely uh, respiratory centers in the brainstem and the reward pathway. So this leads to uh, adverse events uh, with the medications. Uh, over overdose of opioids can be treated with naloxone and then opioid use disorder uh, can uh, be treated with methadone or buprenorphine. So I hope I've uh, provided with you with some good reminder information as we go into uh, the rest of the day today. And uh, I appreciate uh, your attention. And I'll